Welcome to the 37th episode of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today, our guest graduated from St. Mary's in 1985. He studied at University of Pennsylvania, where he earned a bachelor's in math and a BSc in finance. Born and raised in Japan, he carried a Taiwanese passport until age four before naturalizing to become Japanese. He also attended the Tokyo Chinese School during his primary years. He has been a fine he has been involved in financial companies for 30 plus years and currently is serving as representative director for Wells Fargo Securities in Japan. He is also currently chair for St. Mary's Alumni Association from 2020 to 2023. He is also an avid athlete, having completed 60 full marathons and nine Ironman events. Him and his wife, Miwa, have three children who studied at St. Mary's and Te Sen, uh, respectively the class of 2008, 10, and 12. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Raymond. Thank you, Nick. Um, very excited and also a little bit nervous. Uh, there's no, no reason to be nervous. I'm a little bit nervous too. <laughs> it's, um, it's a lot of breath here to cover. But I, I think if we were to sort of summarize the big topics we're going to touch upon today is one, you have that unique um, perspective of not just being a former student, but also a parent who has, you know, uh, had, uh, their, had your own children attend. Tokyo um, International School, Seisen and St. Mary's. The second is obviously a very, very extensive financial career, which includes, you know, some stints at Goldman Sachs and um, Bear Stearns, which we'll definitely talk about, you know, what happened in 2008 and, of course, what you do currently at Wells Fargo. And finally, the last topic would be um, just this being sort of dual culture from being Taiwanese and Japanese in that process of naturalization. And if time... Uh, permits uh, maybe a bit on the triathlon and Ir Ironman, um, <laughs> 60 volt marathons. Is, uh, so um, I want to jump right into sort of the international school experience. You graduated in 1985 from St. Mary's, and then later uh, you had your own children at Penn International School. So what I want to know at a personal level, as well as being an educator in the system, is why did you choose to send your students, or not your students, or your children, uh, to international schools when you were in Tokyo? First of all, um, actually, my wife and I debated uh, quite extensively. Uh, she's Japanese, Japanese, uh, whether uh, Japanese system or international system living in Japan um, uh, fits our children and what our children want to be. Uh, clearly, I was a bit biased because my own background, as you touched upon, is multicultural, um, I guess half and half Chinese, Japanese and went to different background schools. Uh, but at the same time, um, we knew that uh, Japan would be our... What we ended up uh, deciding is based on where we are and where we think our children would be. All three of my children were born in the United States when I had an assignment overseas. Actually, sorry, uh, two in the United States, one in Hong Kong. Naturally, uh, they started off with uh, English-based uh, kindergarten and elementary schools. We were educating them in Japanese through kumons and various other means. We saw that, that they enjoyed that multicultural. Uh, they weren't afraid of engaging with uh, children of many backgrounds. That decided that um, rather than making a change uh, to Japanese system, that for them to carry on. And then naturally, um, it was St. Mary's, Seisen, ISSA, JSIJ. We all went to school, uh, visited, and they ended up liking uh, St. Mary's and Seisen. And we also knew that um, their primary language probably would be in English. Ended up, um, they speak all fluent Japanese, but not as fluent as native Japanese. Wanted to um, have them carry on good uh, English-based education. Uh, that's how we decided. And one last factor is that um, how my job was, um, given from 1990 to 1990, I started off in Tokyo, went to New York, Hong Kong, Singapore, and then back in Tokyo. We were thinking we may end up moving elsewhere as well. So that's how we decided to put them in international school. So in, in your household, um, there's multiple languages going on, right? English, Taiwanese and uh, Japanese, uh, were, th were there certain, well, at what point did you sort of have to decide that sort of English 
faith-based education is going to be the path to go? Like, was there a pivotal age that you feel like parents have to, at some point, you know, make make up their mind? For us, um, before junior high, uh, we knew we had to make decision. Until then, uh, my profession and job decided where uh, I'll be living, and then what school we send them off, and uh, we just like the. Uh, international schools and abroad rather than Japanese schools. But I would say um, before junior high was uh, one pivotal point that, that we always thought about. And do you feel like with your children, there's, you know, there's different age apart. In fact, you know, two were born in the U.S. First one was born in Hong Kong. Do you see within your children too a big variance in regards to sort of their culture as well as their capacity and language? Well, I wish I can ask them now at the age of 30, 28, and 26, that's where they're they are right now. Uh, at that time, uh, I didn't see there any variance. Uh, I would think they thought three of them uh, were going through the changes together because um, we went through different moves, uh, different schools, transfers, and they had to adjust. But uh, three of them are very close. Um, and funny enough, um, they talk to parents in Japanese among themselves. Uh, they speak in English. Mm. So. Um, yeah, um, they had their own uh, camaraderie. Of course, um, every personality is different, so I, I'm sure they have different character, but um, going through that phase of uh, changes, uh, it felt like uh, there wasn't much of a variance. Thing that, uh, yeah, I, I just feel like that's such an ongoing theme with especially, I, I'm in my 30s, so you know a lot of my friends now, in fact, one of my closest friends sends his son to YS, and it's just such a tough decision to make whether or not they're going to go the Japanese route or the international school route. And probably because the Japanese public school system, you know, is, is so good. Maybe that's why you, know, you were saying that was possibly an option at one point. Um, so personally, you were at St. Mary's back in 85. Obviously, it's much, you know, a lot, a lot has happened since then. So from a parent's perspective, you enroll your, your children and I think you were saying off air when they were in middle school and elementary school. But when you saw them, you know, attending Taysem, St. Mary's, was there any sort of like culture shock you had as a parent? Like not like because you had the experience as a student, but as a parent, were you like, well, I never looked at international schools through this lens? I saw the difference from the time I was there. First of all, um, 80s, uh, there were more expats. By the time my children were there, in late 90s to early 2000s, um, there were more transnationally, obviously, Japanese parents, Korean. So the demographic of the uh, international school has changed. Also, uh, I felt like um, there were a lot of good teachers. There are still a lot of good teachers. We had a lot of brothers in 80s, uh, and we had less of that. Uh, so I think. Um, the emphasis of religion uh, was different at the time I was there versus the time I sent uh, my children to school. And also, uh, I'll say uh, one more thing. The curriculum seemed a bit more rigorous than the time I was there, clearly. And, but that's more about the society rather than international school. Yeah, I completely concur with that perspective. Although we're, you know, we're 20 years apart. I'm almost 20 years apart from the current grad. Yeah, it seems like everything is just so much more competitive and rigorous. And yeah, I, it's just the, this competition of prep schools right, is, uh, seems to be uh, something that will not go away in the near future. Sort of shifting gears uh, to your professional career, you graduate kind of in a crazy time because 1990, so it's five years in university because you took a gap year, your junior year. You, you graduate, you make it to Japan, but then the bubble burst in 91. So I was wondering, not only is the bubble burst, but you're also in the financial sector. So what was it like being in the financial sector when we saw this, you know, one of the greatest financial downfalls of the 20th century? Actually, it turned out to be a very good time for uh, people like my background or my peers who went through uh, bilingual or multicultural uh, system to um, going to Japan in finance. In late 80s, uh, Japanese financial market started to open up. Um, and um, yes, uh, surely there was real estate bubble and um, economy and Nikkei was going down. It was the years where late 80s, early 90s were 
foreign firms where it was much easier to come into Japan and start establishing. So I'll give an example. So at that time, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, which is not the firm I chose to go to, were only like uh, 200 people. Now uh, they have about 1,000. Using that ex example, many of the um, foreign firms, financial firms, because of the um, deregulation were just started to beef up. Mm -hmm. Myself, I was very fortunate. I started off in a company called Bankers Trust and uh, was lucky enough to be assigned uh, to the area of um, capital markets and derivatives. And derivatives happened to be the most innovative tool uh, that um, helped various uh, risk management and uh, investment in the 90s. So, uh, sure, economy was going sour, um, but uh, there were a lot of uh, clients who needed help because of that, including Japanese financial institutions and uh, foreign firms uh, like Goldman Sachs Bankers Trust was able to help throughout the 90s, and that's how they grew their footprint, and now they have sizable presence. So despite the economy sort of going down, you felt like because of your unique background, you weren't really getting, you know, hit as hard as a Japanese native like at a Japanese company. That's right. That's right. And then you, you take your career outside of Japan right, to the United States as well as Hong Kong. And um, you mentioned, again, off air, how you at some point in your career went alone uh, to certain cities. And I, I wonder, um, I always wonder if it was expats, because obviously you, you deal with all expat families too, I imagine. Is that sort of format of where companies send entire families across seas, you know, to this sort of expat package, is that changing to more just sending the person working and then having the family stay at home? Okay, uh, let me uh, touch upon it in two ways. Um, generally, um, expat is uh, becoming extinct. Um, a lot of overseas assignment people, surely senior people, uh, would be transferred with uh, full uh, cost of living adjustment, etc. But uh, that's definitely less prevalent um, uh, compared to the time uh, we were high school students. But uh, specifically for me, uh, the reason why I ended up going to Hong Kong by myself for a couple years, uh, twice, is twofold. One, um, I was able to do that because I had my wife and I had chosen to send our children to boarding school since junior, junior high. Uh, they went through St. Mary's, St. Sam, but they didn't graduate. We thought um, putting them into a uh, U.S. boarding school was a good thing, or they thought as well. So it gave me a lot of freedom to be more flexible on the job. Uh, and also, um, there were plenty of uncertainty as to, sure, you get new opportunity in Hong Kong, you move but whether that would be successful or not. We, both time we made a family decision that it was good that, that I go there first, uh, ended up um, for first stint, I was there two years and second stint, I was there uh, three and a half years and came back to Japan. And do you ever feel like when these opportunities come about, it's obviously a huge family decision. And when you, when you make those decisions, are they based on these timelines that are set by the company? Like the company says in three years, you know, Raymond, you'll, you'll be back. Or is it just you go and then it, it, you're, you're not sure, you know, how long your, your stint is going to be in Hong Kong? Yeah, it's more latter. Yeah, I kind of want to rewind the clock back to um, Japan, the bubble bursting, 90, 91, 93, right, about between that period. I was wondering, yeah. as someone who has, you know, these connections to Taiwan, Taiwan's obviously not economic, you know, powerhouse it is today. I don't know if it's economic powerhouse, but you know, economically, uh, you know, well, well, company, a country doing very well. Um, at any point in your career in the '90s, though, even though it was, I think, some like ten thousand dollars a year of GDP per capita, its growth was just insane, right? Fifteen, twenty percent, right? Something like yeah. four times what you know mainland China is right now. Uh, was there at any point kind of a, a part of you that was like, I want to go to Taiwan and you know, see what's happening there development-wise in the 90s and 2000s? I always felt like I'm attached to Taiwan, uh, probably more so than mainland China. I actually have uh, some relatives still living in mainland China, southern part, for two reasons. One, um, I went to Tokyo Chinese schools. 
as you have uh, mentioned, and many of my uh, classmates now live in Taiwan, so I have a lot of uh, just old contacts there. And second, uh, in mid nineties, when I was working out of Hong Kong, one of the market uh, I needed to cover was Taiwan. So I have traveled there probably once every two, three months and be part of uh, that business. Yes, it is interesting. Uh, it is in nineties, uh, uh, it was Taiwan, Korea, and Singapore, uh, which were, I think they were coined as an Asian dragon or something. Um, seen the next phase of growth after Japan. Yeah, that, that, that must have been a crazy time because you also were there in Singapore like, during sort of its ascension uh, in regards to its economy. And today, I mean, I, I've only seen videos, but like the airport, that's like roller coasters, I don't know, it's something crazy. Um, yeah. When you were there, did, did you see um, sort of the extent of how much it was growing? Well, I was there in 98, so almost 20 plus years, um, I wouldn't have imagined uh, Singapore would not only grow economically, but uh, end up positioning as one of the key international hub competing with Hong Kong and Tokyo, uh, both in terms of uh, commerce and uh, finance. And so going back to Taiwan, I, I feel like identity is a, you know, a key theme that runs throughout this podcast. You naturalized to become a Japanese citizen at age four. And I was Googling these stats today, but unlike America, you know, where there's a lot of people become American right, every, every, every day, every year. You know. But in Japan, it's something like a thousand a year. So just a few people become Japanese a day. So I was wondering with this process, obviously you were four, so I don't think you remember too much, but I'm sure, you know, maybe you've talked to your parents about it and whatnot. And I'm curious. When it comes to your identity, how much of you is still like Taiwanese and how, when do you feel Taiwanese? My father and I talked about um, obviously origin um, and it took him uh, a very amazing hardship for him to come across from China to Hong Kong and ended up being assigned to Japan. And as he was uh, moving from China to Hong Kong prior to communist takeover in 49, he was lucky enough to get Taiwanese passport. And so we're not born in Taiwan, but the, he had Taiwanese passport. And um, he ended up marrying my mother, who's Japanese, so it was a natural path. Um, I, I think, um, to me, identity is not just about um, country or passport you carry, but um, what kind of, um, you mentioned culture, uh, ancestor you carry, uh, family origin, and my family origin happens to carry both Chinese Taiwanese origin and Japanese origin. So I rarely identify myself as Chinese or Taiwanese or Japanese, but um, there are moments that made me think more like what my father taught me, which is which has more uh, Chinese flavor. And uh, what my, my mother had taught me or what the environment had taught me uh, because I was born and raised here. And of course, going through St. Mary's, um, what it means to be a bit more global and international at times. So I, my identity crisis um, was more about uh, having multiple identity mm. rather than not being sure of one identity or the other. So you're saying it's beyond Taiwan and Japan, but you you have to start having these third, fourth sort of. You know, it's a mainland yeah. China, and you also have that St. Mary's. Yeah, in- yeah, a lot of good input. So, so when somebody asks, "What is your the identity?" I don't have an answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I can definitely uh, empathize with that. Although um, sometimes I get lazy and I just say California because uh, that <laughs> avoids the question. <laughs> You know, um, is um, w- with your children then? So they would, um, you know, they're also of mixed descent. And in my family, for example, my middle brother, I was just much more American than me. And when I say that, I mean things like um, very soft stuff, like, uh, like he likes baseball, American baseball. I like mm-hmm. Japanese baseball. 
<laughs> that kind of stuff. And you know, he lives in Kansas, whereas I, I wouldn't, I have no interest in living in the States. So mm. with children, was it, was it, was there also sort of like a, a variance in regards to those who picked up certain identities stronger than others? Yeah, uh, definitely there's a variance. And uh, funny enough, my wife and I occasionally talk about how come we brought them up same way, all three of them, and they ended up such uh, having a, such a diverse life. Uh, my oldest son lives in Washington, Washington D.C. Uh, he likes it there. Um, very unlikely he'll come back to Japan. My daughter uh, just like the mountains, so she she's married and living in a deep part of Nagano, which is Japan, but the clearly lifestyle is very different. And my youngest son uh, lives in Tokyo, not with us, but um, ended up in finance industry. But from our perspective, um, we brought them up the same way. Do they have um, different identity? I would imagine so. Uh, clearly the one that lives in US versus one that uh, lives in Japan. Um, whatever they went through, they probably chose uh, which country uh, or what environment uh, fits better for them. Yeah, that's really cool to hear. Nagano, Tokyo, and Washington, D.C. So it seems like a lot of these families are coming from, you know, St. Mary's Day, Taijay, where siblings are in different countries. Although uh, it, it does sometimes get a little lonely um, that we're not closer, you know. But um, at the same time, it's, I feel like it's sometimes sort of the destiny of the international student, right, or the, inter or the TCK, right. that we're all sort of spread across the world. So um, off air, we spoke a bit about Bear Stern, and um, I was really intrigued when I was looking at very lengthy time in finance that you were at Bear Stearns in 2008. And, you know, for people who are not familiar, that's when they filed Chapter 11 uh, during the, you know, the, what Japanese would say, the Iman Shoku, or Americans would call the financial crisis of 2008. And um, yeah, I wanted to ask you basically, what was it like being there then? And you also mentioned off air, it was a moment that really defined who you were. So if you can maybe elaborate on that, uh, that'd be great. I was in Bear Stearns from uh, 2003 to 2008. Um, at that time, uh, I was effectively uh, number two in Japan and also was looking after um, Asia Pacific for um, what people call fixed income trading uh, business. Had a good, I would say, 40 plus maybe 30, so so many people working in Japan and Hong Kong a bit in Singapore uh, doing uh, trading and sales. And we knew uh, something was going wrong with not just Bear Stearns, but several other companies that uh, had higher leverage uh, and was less capitalized. And um, of course, um, March 2008, uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, with um, Fed strong uh, guidance, uh, JP Morgan came out and uh, bailed us out. It was um, a tough moment uh, in my fin financial career, uh, but you go through that every couple of years. But um, what made me learn uh, is that first, um, it's really about the people um, when uh, shit is hitting the, hitting the fan. Um, because when things are going well, actually, um, who you're surrounded with, yeah, of course, good people helps. But uh, you realize, um, when ship is about to sink and you need to still do the best and uh, navigate through. Um, I felt like I was fortunate that um, I was able to surround or I was surrounded by uh, good uh, people. And at that time, um, when instruction wasn't clear from headquarters, New York, because um, they had bigger problem to deal with. Um, uh, there was a week where we had to make local decisions um, pretty much by our own, using our best uh, professional judgment. And also, um, once we were told that uh, we'll be partnering with uh, JP Morgan, do that negotiation as well. So it's definitely like a month where there was no script and you just had to deal with it. So good people, and then believe in your professionalism and experience. And Going through that, um, I had gone through several uh, financial crises, including um, well, COVID is one of it. I feel like um, I have built a very strong perspective 
how I want to be cool myself down and get to work when things are difficult. I, I'm sure there will be many more difficult challenges、uh, coming through my life, but at least on the job, I can always go back there and say that, look, whatever you're doing was、um, challenging at that time. So it kind of defined me, gave me the bandwidth to deal with uh, uh, many different challenges um, that um, I had faced since then. When you guys had that one week to make autonomous decisions sort of locally, What, what was on the table,、um, at least for what you can share? I mean, were you guys in talks with other people? Were you guys thinking about you know, just moving a certain number of employees to another location? I mean, what were those decisions that you had to make?、Um, it's less about、um, people, but more about、um, so called market risk. In trading sales business, there were certain market risk that the operation carries. And、um, you can imagine it was a very volatile time. So, whether to reduce or hold on to certain risk,、uh, you have to decide. And usually,、uh, in normal、uh, s i t u a t i o n you get to talk to your headquarter and get some consent, guidance, approvals, etc. But、um, that、uh, process was kind of missing. At the same time,、um, when you lay off, Or adjust certain market risk. Typically, when a company is in not in good status, many of the counterparty, other financial institutions, not willing to deal with you.、Mm. Right? Uh, in case there is a credit risk or other risk、uh, being involved. So, there you have to go around and look for a counterparty、um, who can, who's willing to engage、uh, with Bear Stearns. at That time、um, to transact and also、um, uh, transfer a certain amount of risk. Wow. And you just mentioned、um, a few minutes ago about COVID 19 being you know, another great challenge in your financial、uh, you know, career. And、um, there's often, you know, the people have been drawing comparisons、right? because they both obviously have. It's really、uh, damaged the economy. But from your perspective,、um, do you find what's going on with COVID 19 to be worse, or is it about the same, or is it not as bad as what transpired in 2008? It's hard to compare,、um, but if, if I had to choose between better or worse,、uh, I would think、um, it would be worse in terms of、uh, potential damage that it can create. Uh, because、um, one reason, we don't know how long it takes、mm-hmm. to finish this、uh, COVID impact. Whereas,、um, for lack of a better word, whether it's Bear Stearns or Lehman,、um, uh, who had a liquidity and capital problem, at least、uh, there were healthy financial institutions who could step in, buy them out, or help them out, and with government and central banks helping. People believe that it can be contained. Whereas this time,、um, central bank, I think, is doing the right things around the world, but、uh, we, we just don't know、uh, how long it takes. So I think、um, the outcome, I'm not sure, but the potential damage, I'm pretty sure,、uh, can be worse if we don't manage through this one very well. Yeah, that's a great point about uncertainty. Whereas I guess you're, you're right with 2008. There were certain banks that, I mean, this is a whole n o t h e r conversation to have, but they were financially healthy for, for certain reasons, usually because of their size, or they, they have more assets and they were able to sort of absorb the, the blow right, as opposed to you know, Bear Stearns and Lehman.、Um, but yeah, these, these times of COVID,、um, the uncertainty is definitely helpful. And hopefully, <laughs> next time、um, we talk, this whole thing has. Been resolved, and everyone can kind of look back and remember these crazy times when we only communicated on Zoom. At least that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> but, yeah, but、uh, I, I think, Nick, you touched on a great point, and、uh, I'd, I'd love to send a message to any and every person listening to this, this podcast. Um, you know, um, what we're going through, and whichever industry, what stage of your life, etc. Um, you know, um, 
the strength we pick up um, into your character through this experience, whatever hardship you're going through, would definitely help define later part of your life. And that's how I try to engage uh, day to day, uh, despite dealing with difficulties at company. Obviously, we have friends who is going through um, difficulty financially, their life and death situations, but there's always things that we can pick up for. Let, let, let's all do that. And uh, to your point, Nick, uh, yeah, we can talk it out <laughs> when this is all done. Yeah, I, I look forward to all the, all the mass gatherings so. <laughs> in, in the future. Not now, though, like Steph and you. Uh, but, um, the, uh, the next topic I want to move, move on to is Alumni Council. Um, you're really sort of revamping, you know, the way alumni networking should work. And, you know, you shared with me, you know, for example, you had this entire seminar, right, on Zoom where you have all these different alumni from different industries. So can you tell me a bit about sort of your vision in regards to how you want to sort of continue to pursue and have pursued this position as the president of the um, St. Mary's Alumni Association? We are given a bit of unique background by, fortunately, for most of us going through international school. And uh, there's plenty of, uh, for lack of a better word, value that can be created. But um, a lot of value is not just about uh, being self-inspiring, but connecting with people with similar background is inspiring each other. And um, not just St. Mary's, but I know SIJ as well, uh, to a certain extent, uh, SAS and ISSH alumni connect. But more for um, physical uh, nomikai gathering, at the same time, um, bigger events. All these four schools used to have this thing called IACJ in early 2000s to do block party, etc. Um, I inherited from Paul Kuo, um, uh, one of the things we were talking about is how to have a better platform. And we knew pre-COVID, uh, we wanted to go online because online will create more inclusivity for um, alums uh, living abroad and lower the barrier for older alum and younger alum because um, at least on screen, younger alum is, should be less overwhelmed by uh, older alum. Um, then COVID came about and we were very lucky that a um, few of the younger alums, and some of them are very smart, uh, computer um, science uh, background, and they're current incumbent college students. Their summer plans were all thrown out because of COVID. They came to uh, through high school counselor and wanted to look for uh, internship opportunity. And we thought that we can collaborate together and then we decided that 2020, we're going to, for like, for, I used to work a strong word, did start digitizing some of our experience so that um, as an alumni association, um, we can uh, institutionalize some of the content and be a bit more um, met methodical about connecting the dots so that the opportunity for every alumni who is in community have better opportunity. And, and that ended up being uh, first uh, online current networking event. We had held that for eight years, just eight years. But we were able to connect more relevantly younger alums with older alums because it's online. We also, um, as a St. Mary's Alumni Association, making a stronger statement this year. Um, we want to include um, more of younger alum from ASIJ, SIS, ISSH start. We want to have alumni parents or uh, current high school, current school students, uh, parents to understand better. And we know uh, going online, digitize, uh, digital transforming um, will allow us to disseminate better. So we're going to try to take up on all that in uh, until 2023 and our leadership group is on. Um, uh, very committed because we feel like um, uh, we're fortunate uh, to be at this turn um, timeline, but uh, we really need to capture it. And um, with COVID, uh, one benefit is um, we, we, we are constrained by physical gathering. Mm. Uh, that means um, if we do it right by doing 
uh, spiritual and online uh, outreach, uh, people should have more time and interest uh, to be associated with. Yeah, that's, that's a great point about just getting rid of that barrier of travel. And I've always thought of that with the, you know, five year, 10 year, 20 year, you know, reunion. It's just that becomes such a, I guess, a barrier that for a lot of people, they just don't have the time, you know, or, or the, sometimes the money to, to, to make that travel. Or it yeah. seems like online, you know, using this modality as a way of communication seems to be the way forward. And um, you shared with me this PDF, well, really interesting, right? The, the way you guys have these uh, alums, and uh, it's interesting you mentioned young alums. How, I guess, the, yeah, the, the best way to put it is what's been the most surprising aspect about working with like the really young alums, like the ones that, let's say, two, 2015 and younger, um, you know, through working with them and collaborating with them, you know, for this um, summer or internship slash, you know, job recruitment uh, information sessions you, were, you guys hosted at St. Mary's Alumni. What was, um, yeah, what was it like working with people that were, you know, that young? Yeah, actually, uh, we were talking about that uh, as we were having a meeting uh, past weekend. Um, so one thing amongst uh, the di digitization we're going through, um, we adopted Slack uh, as a medium of communication so that, that we can retain uh, we can create threads uh, and we can pass it on to next generation. And that's just January. So as older leaders started to by younger alum, clearly they are much more attuned to using these tools. So in that platform, they're much more transparent about their thoughts. Well, I'm not sure vocal is the right word because I don't like your voice, but um, it's clear. And that actually gives a constructive pressure to older alum mm. to partner with them and uh, run certain projects together. So that was a very inspiring because um, I always tell this to um, many of the alums, including class of 2020. Well, once alum, we're just alums, right? I'm 85, 2020. Yes, um, I may be your life senpai, but we're just an alum. So as an alum, um, what we try to do, uh, what we want to do, we start from a flat base. But uh, once we decide that we'll do it together, uh, we have the same accountability, irregardless of whether I'm older, younger. But of course, uh, older alum and younger alum have different skill sets. We should play on each other's uh, uh, skill sets, but it's, it's flat base. But the younger alums are very strong once they're given an opportunity. That's really cool to hear you guys use Slack because um, that's been one of my goals because I have this experience currently working with, um, I work with a, a junior, I guess he's going to be a junior this, uh, this fall. He's a high school student, but we founded this conference together and we've been using Discord, uh, which is very similar to Slack. And um, yeah, I, I've just been blown away by some of the technological sort of changes. Because for example, I usually have students sign like a form, uh, PDF, you know, and then they, they take a, you know, the scanner phone. And I thought that was high tech. And then it was like, um, no, they can do it digitally, like on their computer. And I was like, oh, like, that's right. They, they can skip a step that way. And it's just, it's um, obviously, yeah, they, they do have, certain skill sets they need to work on because because <laughs> they're younger so you know they don't have that experience but yeah that's, that's really cool to hear about you guys yeah you mentioned about like younger alums certain skill sets and um that's really about uh, dealing with people because um clearly as we get older we have more opportunity to deal with people and um we also found that um having a flat community amongst alum uh, alum leaders actually if there's when, if there's anything that the older alums giving in return to a lot of contribution, younger alums giving, it's really about um, just having an engagement, mm -hmm. allowing them to have a chance to um, ask questions. Otherwise, uh, they wouldn't be able to ask to their parents or, or they just don't have that many friendly adults uh, who have similar backgrounds. So I think um, uh, having that forum by itself uh, I believe uh, should be a benefit for a younger alum to be. Yeah, I, I really admire what you're doing with the alumni 
there. And as you said, um, I, I really um, think it's cool too that you guys are willing to embrace, right? If anyone's listening from ASIJ, say SEN, YS, a sort of like a conglomerate of international schools because, you know, at the end of the day, I suppose within our schools, we feel closer, but there is definitely sort of this brotherhood, sisterhood of just being Inta in general. You know, it's like someone. Uh, absolutely. Inta. It's like, oh, you're, you're Inta too. And I, it's, it's, it's really cool what you're doing. So um, we're going to briefly at the very end here, touch upon Iron Man and um, the marathons. Um, I'm personally very intrigued because I, uh, I run, uh, I don't run marathons, but I run like 10 Ks and 20 Ks and, my knees are already giving out, uh, which is very worrying because <laughs> I'm still in my 30s. Uh, but you've done already um, many Ironmans. And I was wondering what made you start doing Ironmans and try, like, when did this begin and um, how do you train for it? So, Nick, I know you're a soccer player. Uh, I wasn't a soccer player. Um, I was a wrestler, so far from that running stuff. I wasn't in track and field or cross country. But um, in 2002, so uh, that would have been my age of 35, uh, as I was working in Hong Kong, my team, um, we decided that we wanted to do a 100-kilometer walk charity and be wow. good at uh, fundraising. <laughs> wow. um, and uh, yeah, we fundraised, but um, to that, uh, I started uh, running uh, and training. Not very fast, uh, but consistently. And um, as I started to run, uh, I started to meet uh, people I wouldn't meet uh, otherwise. Mm -hmm. Because um, that took me out of international school community and finance-related community. And I just meet uh, whomever uh, that's passionate and run running with uh, no strings attached. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was cool things. Uh, you get to travel. and as I counted, I ended up running um, a 60 from marathon and um, I still carry on um, because um, when you're healthy, uh, it uh, clears your mind and gives a better balance for uh, life. Uh, for Ironman, um, well, uh, I was looking for something new to do uh, in 2012 as I came back from Hong Kong uh, for third time. Uh, I was doing running and uh, trail running. It was very hard to do trail running here in Japan. And somebody said that, uh, well, Ironman uh, is coming back in Japan 2013. And uh, as you know, Ironman is 3.8 kilometer swim, 180 kilometer bike, and then four marathon. Mm. And um, I was bold enough to just sign up and then buy a bicycle and <laughs> start training, knowing that um, there would be other friends who who's doing that uh, with us with me and then ended up carrying on um you know, i'm typically a person where i said uh, well i'm gonna just do it and then figure out how i'm gonna do it and mm. well, that's it's how i can carry on that's inspirational that you started at 35 though so 60 marathons so that that's a lot of marathons a year and um, I'm guessing right now with COVID uh, you probably don't have as much opportunity but I imagine um, hopefully a lot a lot more will come uh, next year so um, today got yeah, we covered an array of things right from just being your you know the identity to kids going to school versus you going to school talked a bit about Bear Stearns um, St. Mary's Alumni Association and um, triathlons and Ironman and at the end here I like to have the guest share with us what is on the horizon, what's coming up in the next few years, maybe next few decades. So uh, the mic sort of virtually is yours. If you want to share with the guests, oops, sorry, something dropped. Um, if you want to share with us what is coming up uh, in your life the next few years, the next few decades, that'd be great. All right, so thanks, Nick. And well, I'll touch upon um, being an international school alumni and uh, St. Mary's Alumni Association because that got me connected with you and allowed me to have this wonderful opportunity, first podcasting of <laughs> whatever I say in my life. But uh, what I said earlier, I truly believe. And when that I becomes we and uh, we create relevance, and like today, have few touch points to work together. Nick, we may not talk for another month or two, but we know 
when there's something that's relevant to you and vice versa, we'll bring other alumni or people friendly to our community to in this circle. And I truly believe in that and um, digitization actually enhances that um, wet and friendly relationship. But of course, um, as you mentioned, um, at times we should meet, hug each other, embrace each other. But right now, um, I'm going to keep on pushing this, um, um, how, how much digital can help us really look into the value that we innately have within our community and be able to make it a bit more transparent and inclusive. So that's my next couple of years on SMAA. Hopefully, uh, in a couple of years' time, well, for you, maybe 10 years' time, 20 years' time, um, somebody will be do carrying on your podcasting because mm -hmm. it cr creates a, a lot of value uh, and you create a lot of legacy. And um, I can say similar to uh, what we're doing as an alumni association and um, to what I just said right now. Well, yeah, very inspiring um, things you mentioned today about, you know, uh, sort of persevering through COVID, just like how you persevered in the 2008 uh, crisis. And um, yeah, it was overall, this is nice talking to you. And again, I hope um, we'll have you back on, um, said maybe around the winter, uh, hopefully by then it'd be about episode 60 or so. So um, yeah, uh, let's, let's catch up again then. And um, again, thank you so much for being a guest today. Well, thank you, Nick. It, it was a pleasure, and uh, I truly enjoyed it as well. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Mm -hmm.